sat on every one of them uh, several times. Never could figure out there was never any traffic, but we sat there anyway. But the point is that these, this multitude came into D.C., the Occupy Movement, with their labor allies and uh, had a massive lobby day. Uh, a little different than just sitting in, a little different than some of the other tactics they've used in the past, but maybe an indication of what's to come. And I'll talk a little bit about that too. But first of all, I got to tell you about my special experience when I finally got to go to jail for justice, okay, with this guy. It was the most interesting day for me. First, you got trained by nuns on civil disobedience, a particular group of folks from Chicago who were absolutely fantastic. I had gone through that training before, but that was a good reminder. It was a good training. Then you went down in front of these factories in town particular staley, and our job was, group by group, you march in front of the gate, sit down, so the trucks you know, uh, coming out of staley would not be able to pass. Those trucks were not union drivers. So, you know, dutifully, uh, my group came up, eight of us stood, you know, stood and sat down in front of those trucks. And it's kind of an eerie feeling, because you've got a Mack truck here, 
and you got a SWAT team coming at you here. It's a little eerie. But I felt comfortable because on one side I had Father Magnet, on the other side I had uh, one of the eight street uh, nuns from Chicago. So I figured either I was going to be saved or I had easy access to last rites. <laughs> well, after being arrested and you know, handcuffed and shackled with those little plastic cuffs, right, they kept falling off. And I was kind of embarrassed, so I kept putting them back on. <laughs> you know? So it was that kind of event. But then, of course, I was hauled off to jail, which turned out to be a warehouse. When you, when you get arrested and they take you to a warehouse, you get nervous at first, okay? But then you find out it's just a processing barn. But then no time at all, and $100 later, I was back on the street. Well, a couple months passed, and uh, one of the uh, activists, uh, a good friend, a uh, sister nun uh, of um, Father Magnus, she called and said, have you got your subpoena yet? And I said, no, should I have gotten it? Said, no, you're supposed to be in the court. We're all supposed to be in the court on such and such day. And if you haven't received it, you better be there anyway. So I went to court, here we were, all the civil disobedience types, and I kept waiting for my name to be called. I kept waiting and waiting and waiting, and I hear my boss's name called, but he wasn't there. And it dawned on me, the police had transposed the employer for the arrestee, okay? So I did the only thing I thought was sensible. I pled guilty. <laughs> What I want to talk about a little bit tonight is um, the significance of what happened here in Decatur and how it's affected progressive labor organizing on uh, this part of the world. What I see happen here uh, in the 90s and since was a prefiguration of a new movement, a much more engaged labor movement, a movement that's not yet fully evolved, is still developing, but gave us a sense of where we had to go. When you saw the, amount, the degree of unity of uh, working people in this town, uh, the uh, engagement, labor folks and community folks from all around Illinois, Indiana, and elsewhere, uh, coming to the behest of, of workers here in Decatur. It was an amazing thing to witness. It is something none of us could ever forget. I had one activist I brought over here during that period. Uh, she had actually organized the support staff uh, in the K-12 uh, Unit 4 schools of Champaign. Pretty much on her own. Incredible person, but never been in a demonstration. Uh, she was eager to come here and take part. Uh, she was very, very critically ill uh, with a heart condition. But she marched all across this town, you know, sat in the streets with us, waited to be arrested with us. Uh, she said it was the best thing that ever happened. She lived long enough to participate in the events of this town in that momentous moment, and died shortly after. But that, that's the kind of thing you never forget about what happened here. It's a very personal thing when you see how this movement has evolved. What I want to talk about is the significance of the Decatur situation relative to how we've seen an involvement of organizations, particularly coalitions of labor and community, which is probably the next best step for us. We know what's happening to the unions. We're under attack across the country. We've seen a tremendous decline in the unionization of the private sector. Of course, I come from the public sector. It's tough there, too. We've seen what's happening in Wisconsin. We've seen what's happening in Indiana, you know, 12 other states, uh, with a uh, juggernaut of right-wing supported corporate finance uh, union rights takeaways. It's absolutely dangerous out there. It's, unprecedented, at least in the 40 years I've been active in this movement. By the way, this fall was my 40th year. I figured it was time to retire uh, and uh, do these kinds of things. The kind of thing that happened during the decades of the decade of the 90s and the last 10 or so years is Organizations like Jobs with Justice coming into being in this part of the world. That's an interesting group. There are about some 50 chapters. There's three in Illinois, Chicago, Champaign, Danville, and one now in the uh, East St. Louis area. Jobs with Justice is not like quite any other organization. 
uh, that the labor movement has been involved in. First of all, it includes unions. It also includes union members. Uh, it includes uh, uh, community groups like the NAACP. Uh, it includes, I'm talking about the Champagne uh, unit alone. Uh, it includes groups like the Healthcare Consumers. Uh, it includes the Catholic Church in the area. It includes the, the Friends Society, their meeting, and others. It includes student groups. So it's that kind of combination of forces that are reaching out beyond the old traditional union base, which is so interesting and so exciting because you just feel the energy that comes from that kind of uh, synthesis. A similar kind of group, as Bob mentioned, is the Campus Labor Coalition, which also includes a DOI, which also includes student groups uh, and uh, centers of ethnic culture, for example, La Casa, uh, and other organizations, student, a black organization, a women's group, others. So it's a kind of expansive notion of what a labor movement should look like, not just our own agendas in, in a particular union or in a particular sector, but engaging people beyond our uh, institutional boundaries. Uh, to give you an idea what that can look like in the Campus Labor Coalition, our number one issue right now, besides uh, fighting for uh, union rights, uh, is tuition waivers and the whole issue of tuition increases. They're preventing a whole uh, uh, generation of kids to have access uh, at the University of Illinois. So those are the kind of fights we're taking on. Taking on the healthcare fight. Uh, the whole notion of, of, of single payer is the Jobs with Justice and the Campus Labor Coalition program. Has to be that. You have to go beyond. Uh, the system we have now. Housing issues. Lately I've dealt more with foreclosure issues than I did with grievances. Because that's what's happening. It's happening at the University of Illinois with some uh, professors. It's happening at K-12 with custodians. It's an across-the-board problem. So the whole issue of stopping evictions, stopping foreclosures is an issue that we embrace. Fighting legislation that, that is attempting to take away union rights has become an increasing focus. And part of what gives us the impetus for tonight's speech is what happened in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, when the uh, General Assembly of Wisconsin came dangerously uh, close uh, to winning that fight against uh, organized labor. Sometimes you think they won, then there's a court decision, they lost, it goes back and forth. But what happened in Wisconsin was very similar to what happened here in Decatur. Thousands of people rallied. Uh, to fight Governor Walker and the uh, draconian legislation uh, that he was advocating. That same kind of energy then was seen in Indianapolis, uh, not always known as a center for uh, activism, but again, another outpouring, several thousand people making their uh, case with the legislature and for a while now uh, have uh, forestalled that legislation up until very recently and we're going to have to go back to the map. Similar kinds of things happened here in Springfield. There was some legislation proposed by some of our friends, uh, even by Madigan, who is a problematic individual, but nonetheless, I might wax eloquent on that for a long time. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, it's, again, it caused us to mobilize our troops, mobilize folks, and come here and make our case again that no more concessions, no more takeaways, we're going to hold the line on keeping unionism alive. We're going to defend our institution. We're going to continue to move in the direction of social justice. That's the purpose of Jobs of Justice. That's the purpose of the Campus Labor Coalition and similar groups. The mode of operation of these groups is that they're pretty wide open. Uh, there's no set agenda. Uh, we do invite uh, you know, established unions to participate. Uh, we also tell people that if you're not in a union, would like to have a union, or, or any union just want to participate as an individual, you're most welcome. So it's both, you know, structurally it engages the labor movement, but also is an activist movement. So it has both representative and participatory qualities. And many of you who've been in the labor movement know those are hard to balance sometimes. Very hard to balance. But the institution, the organized labor uh, union has, you know, their own concerns, their own boundaries, and so when you start to stretch that a little bit, it sometimes becomes a bit of a problem. Uh, being a staffer, 
40 years in the labor move, I can tell you uh, it's not an easy thing. But nonetheless, we've learned how to mature. We've learned how to do both. Work with your union and also bring that movement kicking and screaming sometimes uh, into coalitions with folks who might not ever have thought about were their allies. Uh, and that's what's been so exciting about some of the developments lately, uh, particularly with Jaws with Justice. And another group that's become, becoming uh, more uh, uh, visible is the uh, Illinois uh, People's Action uh, Coalition. It used to be called Central Illinois Organizing Project, but that, that group is evolving. Very similar kind of approach uh, in coalition building as uh, Jaws with Justice same kind of inclusiveness, so that we have people of faith, so that we have youth, so that we have community members, so that we have uh, the black community, so that we have the labor movement, all in one room, fighting for the same causes. Another network that has been established which replicates that same kind of uh, outreach, that same kind of activism, is the Emergency Labor Network, which helped give rise to the Madison in Annapolis and uh, other events across the country. And what's also interesting about these movements, whether it's the Emergency Labor Network or Job for Justice, is that they're not uh, stuck on one particular strategy or tactic. You know, try to darn near anything uh, to see uh, if we can continue to mobilize people, involve people, engage people, and create a powerhouse that cannot be ignored by the power brokers. So the next uh, challenge for the uh, progressive labor movement, besides holding these coalitions together and moving them forward and expanding on our political agenda, was how do we deal with this new thing, this new phenomenon uh, that just erupted called the Occupy movement. First of all, if you study the history of labor in this area, including Danville, Illinois, occupying uh, is not something new. Uh, I was privileged to be part of an effort in the early 70s uh, uh, in the Danville area, helping the high school workers, you know, the, you know, the other Caterpillar uh, company, uh, figure out a strategy that would uh, finally put the bosses on notice that they weren't kidding anymore. They'd been on strikes many times before, but in this particular instance, they decided to do something different. Rather than uh, setting up a picket line, uh, they decided to just stay in the factory and lock the doors. And so for three days, they occupied the factory. It was a sit-down strike, something we hadn't seen since the 1930s. But it was that kind of insurgency, that kind of activism, that gave rise to the coalitions that I'm talking about tonight, that kind of energy, and that kind of willingness to experiment, right? Uh, I guess when the occupied people move from just sitting in to actually using their, their numbers for a lobbying effort, that tells you something. To what extent are we going to move next into the electoral arena? That's a debate that we have to have. We have to be there in some form, if not with outright endorsements, at least pushing the program of progressive labor. And that's my sense of where we're going to go. Now, myself, having come out of the student movement, as Bob rightly noticed, uh, I, sometimes when you go to the Occupy meetings, you think you just went back in time to an SDS meeting Students for a Democratic Society meeting, or to a SNCC meeting, a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee meeting. Those, those great organizations of the 60s uh, that um, you know powered up uh, social change in this country. And it, to give you an example, an Occupy meeting, you better set aside anywhere from four to six hours because they never stop talking. Right? Uh, that's just what comes with that kind of energy. It, it's welcome, but for those of us who have to get home and have our milk and go to bed by 10, it becomes a little bit more of a difficulty. But we're learning how to relate to that movement. It's very important that the organized uh, progressive labor movement not impose itself and all our great wisdom uh, on this, uh, you know, this, uh, this movement. It has to evolve and develop on its own. Uh, and I think that's... Uh, that it, we have a strong tendency just to take over. It's what we do, you know. Uh, I'm not a lecturer by trade, that's obvious. But what I used to do in the labor movement was yell at a lot of people all the time. I think that's what, what was my job. But mainly to get the agenda moved, mainly to get things done. Uh, you can't talk things to death. At some point you have to make a decision, you know. 
Uh, if it takes you two days to uh, figure out how you're going to pay the phone bill, probably not the right uh, question to put on the agenda, but those kinds of things we got to live through, help that movement through, but not uh, in any way uh, decide, hey guys, we're, we know better than you. That's not the kind of uh, approach that's going to work. So we got to be patient, uh, and that's not always the best virtue of a labor person, uh, but we have to be patient and see how it evolves. Uh, the good news is it's a wide open uh, movement. It's uh, still struggling with how extensive a program it's going to uh, embrace, but that's okay. Uh, they'll get there. And what is a problem for all of our movements, again, is coming to terms with race. Uh, and currently that's a, a major effort we're making uh, with the Occupy movement in the Champaign area is really uh, creating more ties of uh, African American uh, uh, churches Hispanic organizations, uh, organizations of, of color that hitherto have not been on our uh, organizing uh, hit list. But that's what we've got to do is build those relationships and the only way we know how. Uh, that is to be there for those folks in their struggles, to be there on the picket line when we're dealing with police brutality or we're dealing with immigrant issues. To be there for those causes is the way that we overcome uh, the issues of race and the barriers of ethnicity. What I learned from Father Magnet was if there are four virtues in this movement, number one is compassion, number two is conviction, number three, courage, and number four, collective action. And I'm willing just to engage that. He uh, taught me a lot, made me a better labor person, made me a better uh, progressive citizen, and for that I will always be truly thankful. Because of him and these merging forces in the labor movement, I think democracy is well served. Uh, we'll be able to retain, preserve, and expand what democracy means in this society. Uh, I think that union rights and democratic rights will be preserved and expanded with this kind of movement, and above all else, that compassion becomes a definition of solidarity. And solidarity is, after all, the one thing that should last forever. Any questions?
uh, anti-public employee stuff that, that happened a lot over the last few months and years. Do you think that that's peak? Do you think that the the the, uh, the part of the Tea Party that's really anti-labor has kind of met its match and it's declining now, or do you think it's think it's on the rise? I, I would be hesitant to say that it's peaked uh, because it's such an explosive political uh, environment. And part of the reason I say that is because the half-life of political consciousness in our country sometimes is about two weeks. And so what may be remembered as a horrendous situation uh, in Indiana or in uh, Wisconsin may look like a new idea in Missouri or Kentucky or somewhere else. Uh, the folks who've been financing those efforts, uh, like the Koch brothers, I have another name for them. The Koch brothers put, like I, I don't know how many millions of dollars into the uh, uh, Wisconsin. I heard something like upwards to 30 million. That kind of, of funding that's going to be even more prevalent, uh, particularly ever since the uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, made the most dreadful decision since Dred Scott when he gave the dollar bill of citizen rights recently. I've heard, so the spigot's wide open uh, and our movement doesn't have the coin. So I would like to think that it's peaked and gone away, but not yet. Yes. Gene, you know, recently in the um, United Kingdom, millions of public ser ser uh, service uh, employees went on strike and intend to go on strike again and again and again so that they have no more take-backs with their pension. Right. When will the U.S. labor movements follow suit? Uh, hopefully yesterday. Uh, the, the attack on our pensions is very serious and very severe. I, I will tell you this. Is the one time that I have managers ask me what's happening in Springfield on their pensions. Okay, that's the one question that's on everybody's mind. Uh, it's an easy target because uh, so many people do not have the benefit of negotiated or uh, yeah, yeah, legislated pensions uh, like so many of us in the public sector. So we're vulnerable. All the more reason for us to reach out and make the, you know, the clarion call that nobody should be without an adequate income in retirement. That has to become our, our job, is to move that issue down the road. Um, but I, I don't see any relenting on the part of the right. Uh, in some cases, even our friends um, have uh, deserted us on the pension issue. Uh, but I remain confident that we'll beat them back. I guess if my follow-up question really is, why, why isn't the U.S. labor as active demonstrably as the, as the people in the United Kingdom? Uh, I think maybe they got some better traditions in the United Kingdom. Uh, there's, a, there's a long history of, of left-wing activism, you know, socialist, social democratic concepts that sometimes have still been foreign to us here. Uh, and I can't give you a direct answer as to why the labor movement sometimes doesn't move. I wonder that almost every day in the last 40 years. Uh, it's because people like me have to go out there and organize it. And the people in this room have to go out there and do the work. Uh, and the one thing that happens, I guess, is that the last thing you think about in terms of what you've got to do tomorrow is to, you know, really find hard for Social Security, Medicare, and pensions if you're 20. But growing, I think, is the consciousness that whether you're 19 or 90, uh, that's an issue for all of us. Yes? This uh, Jobs for Justice, is that what you call no. it? That sounds like a very fascinating concept. Mm -hmm. is, is, there be, is there any effort to go to other cities, or is it so loosely based that nobody's really organizing? Because I don't, I would think that Bloomington, Peoria, Decatur, some of these other cities would benefit from that type of organization that builds relationships with many and, and puts together people of like spirits but, but from different mm -hmm. organizations. Well, in, in fact, it, uh, it exists now in about 50 plus cities, mostly large cities like Chicago and Cleveland and uh, New York. Uh, the effort that we've uh, put together here in downstate Illinois is, is, is a new strategy for Jobs with Justice to do exactly what you say. And if, not, if it's not Jobs with Justice, then it could be a similar kind of organization. 
you know, like the uh, uh, People's Action Group, which does similar kinds of organizing, involves similar kinds of constituencies. So I can see some alliances coming down the road. It may not be justice, justice itself, uh, but the approach makes sense. Uh, you know, the kind of uh, empowerment we've seen from that, this approach makes sense, and we just have to spread the word. Love to see something like that organized here in Decatur. Okay. Yes. Yes, ma'am. And I was just going to say, too, that if anybody here would like to come to Champaign Urbana to our Jobs and Justice meeting and just, you know, kind of get a feeling for what we're doing and who's there and what, we're, what our goals are, and, um, and we can try to help you get started. Chicago helped us get started. Right. So right. we meet every. Uh, Third Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning at the Channing Murray Foundation right. on right. campus, on U of, U of I campus. So everybody's welcome. Certainly, anyone's not welcome. Any questions? Gene, uh, right. thank you. Uh, wh where do you stand, and the people around you stand, with regard to supporting the Obama administration for re-election, given their inability to move the uh, labor agenda forward? It's tough being a democratic socialist at times, and I will admit to being one. Uh, when the alternative is Herman Cain, I'm, I'm thinking that probably Michelle and uh, uh, Barack were doing handstands in the old room every time, you know, Cain came on TV. I mean, that was almost fun. I was praying that he could get uh, the. Uh, the nominee. Uh, I think what's going to happen is that as frustrated as I am, I think we've had incredibly missed opportunities. I'm just, hell, I'm retired. I can say this now. Uh, healthcare should have been moved harder, faster, in a different way. Uh, the jobs thing is still problematic in my mind. You know, where, where's the beef? Uh, and you can just see the time after time you know, as, as, as many of you here have, have, have experienced in uh, negotiations, you don't walk in with a compromise position. You walk in with your maximum position, plus two. And then you work from there. But it seems to be the strategy of this administration to walk in with what they think is everybody could agree on and find out that that gets whittled away. And so I think strategically there's been some uh, errors. However, having said that, absent some other progressive candidate coming forward that I have not seen. Uh, most likely, we'll be working uh, again for the Democratic re-election. Do I wish it could go farther? Darn to me. Uh, but if the alternative is the current array of Republicans, we will, have, we will find ourselves, as we have before, uh, working for the Democratic candidate. It's going to be hard to mobilize folks, though, and this is the second time around. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, how that's going to work. It won't be the same kind of spontaneous reaction that we had in the last election. We're going to have to do some harder arguing. Yes? Do the unions have the strong leadership today as they have had in the past, like the Walter Ruthers and the John? Uh, I think there's an emerging leadership. Uh, are they all at the top of the union movement right this moment? No, but I'm seeing some strengths in it. I'm telling you, some of the folks I were just at a, a meeting I was at just for two days ago. The young people in that room were sharp. They knew what they were talking about. Well-educated in labor, well-educated in contract unionism, well-educated uh, in organizing. A lot of those folks I saw in the room could be the next uh, leadership. Do I think we have all the leaders we need now? Do I, am I satisfied with the leadership uh, in, uh, as it exists now? Probably not. I'll just be honest. I think we need to be much more militant, much more aggressive, and uh, get out of Washington more. As a former union bureaucrat, I had to be in Washington for 10 years. It's a pleasure to get out of Washington. It just sucks the energy out of it. Right? And it ends up becoming so much the power game of that city uh, and less uh, of getting out there 
kicking down the doors and organizing. I will say this. I was very pleased with the leadership of the unions that have come forth and have endorsed the Occupy movement. I'm very pleased with that. That's a very good sign. And I'm pleased to say that my former employer, uh, the Illinois Education Association, has uh, just um, voted to uh, uh, support and endorse the Occupy movement. Well, heck, if all the students are on the street, might as well join them. Is there a tactic? Is there a tactic that's way better now for unions in one part of the country than another? Well, I think that's probably true because of some of the more draconian laws in some places. Okay. Uh, I think any way you look at it, we have to keep all the various technical options in front of us. Uh, sometimes you've got to occupy something, sometimes you've got to close it down, sometimes you can strike. Uh, we have so many states where the right to strike is problematic. That's one of the issues, you know. I came out of the federal sector. Uh, I can confess now because of statute of limitations, I let a wildcat strike in a veterans hospital. Uh, that was not easy to pull off. But you thought I had just done something to engage the 82nd Airborne, right? Because we finally stepped over that line. Well, we need to step over some more lines. Use all the tactics you have available. And you're right. One of the things that's going to happen depends on the public response in particular areas, you know? Wisconsin's fun, but it's also a very divided state, right? Uh, Illinois can be fun. It's also a divided state, so it's how we keep moving that agenda. We don't want to leave too many people behind, but we don't want to stop moving. That's always a dilemma. You never know if a tactic's going to work until the day after. Holding 